Et encore une fois, bienvenue à tous les participants. Et euh, donc, sans tarder, on va euh, ouvrir la première session concernant l'agriculture. Et on commence par euh, la première conférence plénière qui sera présentée par professeur Fawzi Bukawi de l'Université Polytechnique Mohamed VI de Ben Greer et qui sera intitulé « Plant Biotechnology Contribution to Food Security ». I would like first to thank uh, Professor Motafar and Professor Bursuda for inviting me and sharing with you some of my uh, experience in the area of plant biotechnology. I will first start by giving an introduction and some definitions about food security and biotechnology. Uh, we Revolution. The first green revolution played an important role in, in food security in the 60s and on top. A little bit also of history and background in, in this area. And then uh, define uh, and present some uh, ag biotech application that could contribute to food security. Uh, before coming to uh, the University of Francis uh, Polytechnic, I worked in Canada. And I was managing a program on wheat improvement, and I would like to give some examples of how biotechnology could contribute to improving productivity, and particularly in wheat. Uh, genetic engineering uh, is one of the technologies that could be used to improve uh, food pro uh, productivity, and I'll, I'll focus a little bit on some examples and how, how critical is uh, this technology, and finish with some perspective and concluding remarks. According to the FAO, the definition of food security is food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. There are many challenges that can affect food security. Um, first, there are more than 800 million people that are undernourished. More than 250 of those are, are in, in Africa, and the population is increasing from 7 billion to 9 billion by 2050. We need to improve food productivity by 60% in order to feed all those people. Right now, crop rate improvement is around 1.1%. It has to reach 1.6% if we want to have enough food. And given the fact that there's also a shift to middle class in developing countries, eating more meat, which require more food, more, more, more crops, would be even more challenging. And of course, there's a decrease in the arable land due to erosions, salinity, etc. Water shortage. In, in India, for example, and China, a lot of wheat that's produced is through irrigation and using other water tables that are decreasing. It is expected that in a few years there will be a significant water shortage and, and, and then growth will have to rely on, on rain. And finally, climate change can be a significant factor for maintaining productivity. There are models that look at wheat productivity with the climate change and it is estimated that an increase in 1 degree Celsius in temperature will reduce the yield of, of, of wheat by 6%. There are solutions, of course, and man has endured challenges in the past and overcome them. And I divide those solutions into technological and societal or political solutions. And of course, my talk will focus on uh, the, the technological one, in particular with regard to improving productivity. Reducing waste is another way to uh, improve uh, crop productivity and, and have enough food for the future. Societal political solutions, of course, deals with governance and improved distribution of food and changing nutrition habits. As you, you know, in some countries, for example, North America, there are about a third, third of the populations are overweight. And distributing some of that food will, be, will address some of the issues. So as I said, I will, biotechnology can, can, can address the two uh, uh, aspects of improving uh, productive food productivity and reducing waste, and I'll focus on, on uh, 
the improving food crop, crop productivity. And historically, it, it was shown that it's possible. It is shown that it's possible to improve uh, crop food crop productivities. And this diagram shows an example of the main grains, in particular wheat, barley, maize, where food crop, crop productivity has been improved between 1960 to 2010, almost by a factor of three, thanks to the research that has been done, research and development. On the other hand, grains like millet and sorghum that are grown mostly in developing countries, the productivity has not improved very much. And with research and development and the application of some technologies like biotechnologies, there is uh, optimism that that could be achieved. But it has to be done with sustainability. The improvement of food crop productivity has to be sustainable. What is sustainability? There are two definitions that I selected. There are many. The first one is sustainability rests on the principle that we must meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's one definition. The other is to be sustainable, any farm must meet four goals. Productivity, environmental soundness, financial viability, and social responsibility. The Green Revolution are uh, basically based on technology transfer that was done between the 30s and 60s. Where it was more pronounced and more visible is one increased agricultural production. The production was mostly in the developing world in the 60s. And initiatives that were applied basically and adopted included high yielding variety of cereals, in particular wheat, the use of chemical fertilizer and agrochemicals. There was also irrigation start to be more generalized, and the use of uh, uh, mechanization tractors um, also had in, 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 the, in, in the Green Revolution. Um, an example of the improving productivity is, is highlighted in this, this figure and shown the improvement in, in yield in corn in the state, in the United States of America. As you can see, almost for a century, the, 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 the productivity of... of is, is there a pointer? We have a pointer. That's okay. It's my phone. I try to use this. So as you can see in, in, the, in what's shown in yellow, the, the state, the, 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 the production of corn was stable, but with the application of biotechnology, and in this case it was hybrid corn, starting in the 40s, there started to be an increase in productivity. Another technique of, of, of a crop, uh, of hybrid wheat was developed, and in the later years, and in the later years, it's the application of genetic engineering that had led to this improvement. An interesting point here in 2012, where the yield was not, that's outside this, this, this uh, curve or this, this line, it's because it was a year of drought where the yield was, was significantly affected. Norman Borlaug is, is referred to as the father of the Green Revolution. Some all even call him the man who saved a billion lives. He was a scientist from the United States that worked in CIMIT in Mexico. CIMIT, for those who are not familiar with, is, is, is a large institution, R&D, focused on improving wheat and corn, and received funding from different countries. He played an important role in developing a dwarf wheat varieties, shown in here. And why dwarf? Because with the use of fertilizer, the plants will produce a lot of biomass, and then when it's mature, when they are maturing, they will lodge, so they will fall, and that affects significantly the yield. By, by developing dwarf varieties and introducing some of the traits in dwarf varieties, they are able to withstand the weight, and that has led to a significant improvement in, in wheat yield. The other traits that he worked on is developing uh, varieties that are resistant to rust, and, and I will uh, explain that in the next slide. Basically, he received the Nobel Prize in, 2000, in 1970. It's, I would say, the only prize in agriculture, but there is no Nobel Prize in agriculture, so he would deserve the uh, Peace uh, Prize in the 70s because, again, of the role he played in, in improving crop, crop productivity, in particular, 
in, in the three countries, Mexico, India, and Pakistan, where the yield multiplied by two or three and have provided enough food to several populations. I will be talking about different type of breeding, and I'm not a geneticist, but I think it's important to compare this method to a new method of biotechnology. But my understanding is that to develop a variety of, of, of wheat or, or any, any other varieties, you, one of the methods is to go through what's called back crossing. In the case of rust, for example, where we have a variety of wheat that has all the good qualities of yield, uh, but, but it doesn't have resistance, let's say a rust in this case. But we do have in our possession a variety of wheat that have the rust resistant genes, but on the other hand, doesn't have a good quality and yield. So uh, plant breeders go through a cross, and during the first cross, you've got a mix of both parents, and you have to do several back crossings up to several years, sometimes 10 years, to get to um, a variety or germplasm that will have the resistant genes, uh, but maintaining some of the quality of the, one of the parents. So in this case, Norman Bolog and his team, they cross the, 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 the sensitive, uh, the, the resistant variety, but low quality with the uh, a good quality but sensitive to rust and they obtained uh, a resistance uh, plant and that contributed again to the green revolution. There are a lot of positive impacts that happened during the green revolution. Of course, uh, the yield improved, there were estimated a billion lives that were saved. Because we were producing higher biomass, there was increased CO2 sequestration. And because we produce more yield, we don't have to use as much land, so the farmland expansion has been reduced. On the other hand, there are negative impacts. Overuse of fertilizer and pesticides can be a problem. And as mentioned earlier, there is a groundwater decline, and, and these, the water is, uh, in, in the ground is, is limited. Biotech can contribute to to addressing some of the issues, and, and I will go through some definition. I don't think I need to define again biotechnology after the talk of Professor Albert Sasson, but there are many techniques that could be used. Production for biofuel, fermentation, inoculants, we could use metagenesis, breeding, tissue culture, double haploidy, genetic engineering, genomics, markers assisted selection, diagnostic forensics. All of these are tools that will lead to commercial products. I picked a, a few where I will spend a little bit more time. Double haploidy, genetic engineering, uh, genomics, marker assist selection, and inoculant biology. Now I will switch to giving some of these examples for the program I was managing in, in Canada. And I thought it would be interesting to share with you uh, some of where I was working basically in the province of Saskatchewan. And the reason I mentioned this is very few people know this province. They know a lot about Quebec and Ontario and maybe BC, but very little. So Saskatchewan is about the size of Morocco, and it's a prairie. So it looks like this, most of over the plain. The yellow is, is the canola plant. This is the city of Saskatoon, and this is the plant biotechnology institute where I was working. This province has, has some interesting statistics, and I'll, I'll try to do some comparative, comparison, with, uh, comparison with Morocco. The number of farms, there are 37,000 farms with an average size of almost 700 hectares. About 80% of the farms in Morocco have less than 5 hectares. There's 1 million people, same, uh, whereas 35 in Morocco, living in the same area. And there are 13 million hectares in Morocco, I believe is around 9 million hectares or 10 million hectares. Wheat is, is a main production, 5 0.5 million hectares is, 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 is close to wheat and lentils also. Morocco imports durum wheat. 80% of Moroccan durum wheat comes from Canada. And Saskatchewan produces about 80% of durum wheat. So likely the wheat or the couscous or pasta we're eating coming from this province. And all of these translate in a big uh, dollar value, $14 billion of export of food products. The wheat program we, we was involved with 
was organized in six pillars, two pillars that focus in on improving the efficiency of breathing, one based on tissue culture, one based in genomics. Two pillars were focused on addressing the issues of stresses, either abiotic stress, in particular uh, heat, drought and cold, or biotic stress, in, in particular fusarium and rust. Two pillars were addressing the issue of productivity and improving yield. One focusing on looking at uh, seed and seed development and photosynthesis. And another pillar looking at beneficial microorganisms. And those are the microorganisms that are in the soil that can play an important role in nutrition and uptake of nutrients. The overall goal was to improve yield, sustainability, and profitability of wheat for the benefit of the Canadian farmers and economy. Wheat is a very complex genome. Its size about 17 gigabase, about five times the size of human, and that presented the challenge in making some improvement. We need to understand the complexity to, in order to develop traits that can benefit and improve productivity. But thanks to the progress in genome sequencing, we were able at the National Research Council in, in collaboration with uh, the University of Saskatchewan and within a consortium to sequence a chromosome of wheat. And that's because of the progress in, in technology, as I said. When we started this program in 2000, 2010, it was unthinkable to think about sequencing the genome of wheat. And because of this progress, where the costs have decreased from $100 million to sequence the human genome in, in, in the early 2000s, one to less than thousand dollars around 2015 allowed us to do large uh, sequencing runs and develop markers that can be used in, in assisted breeding. And the marker assisted breeding basically provides greater gain per breeding cycle and the more diverse germplasm. This this is an example of uh, as, um, marker assisted breeding or uh, sometimes it's called genomic assisted breeding where we developed markers that can discriminate between uh, rust susceptible plants and, and, and resistance using SNP marker single nucleotide polymorphic markers this was applied to UG99 a virulent strain of, of, of rust that's now present in Uganda and that can invade other countries and affect the productivity of wheat and, 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 and affect food security. Uh, Morocco would benefit from this research because this was done in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a consortium. And since Morocco gets a lot of its varieties from, from cement or, or, or germplasm from cement, will benefit some of this research. Another example of project we were working on that also of interest to the work done in Morocco is in terms of drought tolerance. Wax, which is present in some varieties, can have an important effect on drought by limiting the evaporation of water. Until this work was done, we didn't know the mechanism which, by which plant will, 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 will fabricate or will, will biosynthesize wax. Some of the colleagues at the National Research Council were able to identify using RNA-seq experiment high throughput genome sequencing to identify the genes and the mechanism by which this uh, geo, the, the wax is, is formed and this was published in PNAS uh, this year. Another example where biotechnology could, could have a, an, an effect on, on yield and productivity is trying to understand seed formation, seed germination, seed, seed development. My colleague Rajudatla or my ex-colleague Rajudatla worked on, on some currently available varieties and did some crossing to generate lines that have either bigger number, higher number of seeds or bigger, num bigger seeds that were shown to be in the field yielding a higher, higher amount of, of grains. Another method based on tissue culture is the use of double haploidy. Double haploidy basically is a, a method that will, 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 will be able to develop pure line and fixed trait. It's based on the use of pollen 
So taking pollen from plants, growing them in tissue culture, making haploid cells, doubling the chromosomes, and then generating plants, and at the end, these plants will be homozygous. This method can reduce the breeding cycle by two to four, cycle, four years, allowing the product to reach the market sooner. And if I should go back to the schematic I, I showed before, so instead of going through, through these whole back crossing cycles, from the first generation, you make double haploid plant that could be used for the next step of AMO breeding. I will talk now about the impact of genetic engineer crops. The reason I choose to talk a little bit about this is I was quite surprised to see the, the reticence and the resistance to genetic engineering. I, I knew about Europe and I knew about the general uh, media that are very much against the use of this technology, but I was very surprised among scientists to see that some of the, my colleagues didn't have uh, some of the background to be able to basically uh, not use this technology. And, and, and I will try to show some of the facts based on, on the use of this technology. Well, first of all, I think everybody is now aware of what's, what's genetic engineering and transformation. There are different types. We can use cisgenic, so that's transferring a gene within the same species, or we could use transgenic from different species. More recently, the, the, the method of genome editing has been developed, and I will spend a little bit later time on this methodology. And transgenic or, or, or genetic engineering can be used with agrobacterium, gene bar binder, or, or electroporation. There's a, a method that's been used in Europe and, and several other countries based on metagenesis. But this method is not considered genetic engineering or not GMO. In, 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 a, in a schematic, I would show compared to the traditional back crossing and breeding, basically we extract or we isolate the gene from the rust resistance, in, if it was the, the case, and I'm using this as, just as an example, and introduce the gene into the plant and saving sometimes during the process. If I illustrate this method, genetic engineering, whereby you, you basically isolate one gene and put it back into a genome, in the, in the case of conventional breeding on the GMO, you are mixing two genomes, and you may end up with a lot of other genes but you don't see them, or you don't see their expression, or their expression is low, and you get your gene that you are looking for. In the case of metagenesis, which is considered non-GMO, or non-genetically engineering, you also make changes in the genome, but here you end up with different mutations, and maybe you are interested only in these mutations, but the genome has changed nevertheless. An elegant case of genetic engineering is, is with this trait that's called BT corn, Bacillus thuringiensis corn, that's now widely commercialized in, in, in uh, North America and, and in Asia, South America. And basically, there are uh, caterpillars that will eat corn and reduce the yield. There are natural bacteria that could be used to kill or to prevent the, the caterpillar from, from affecting the yields. Scientists, what they've done is they understood the mechanism of the bacteria, what's, what's making the caterpillar die, and they extracted the gene that produced the toxin, and they introduced directly into corn. And now corn can produce the toxin without having to uh, basically treat with pesticides. The global benefit from genetic engineering are summarized in here. Uh, an author, two authors, Lumper and Kane, in 2014 basically did a meta-analysis study looking at 147 publications. And they found that with the use of genetically engineered crops, there was a reduction by 37% in chemical pesticides. The crop yielding improved by 22% and the profits, the farm profits improved by 68%. And this was mostly applicable to developing countries. I would highly recommend anybody having 
doubt about the benefit of genetic engineering. This report that was developed by the National Academy of Science was was uh, published, I believe, in 2016. Yes, in 2016, and this involved a committee of 19 members, three boards in the area of agriculture, natural resources, life sciences, nutritional boards. They invited 80 experts that gave talks about the genetic engineering, not necessarily four. They invited all kind of uh, experts. And there were, they collected 700 comments from, from the publics on, on the use of this technology. And this is their conclusion. Genetic engineering leads to favorable economic outcomes. If, if it wasn't the case, it would not be used now in Brazil, as, as Dr. Albert Sasson mentioned, and other countries. The insect resistant trait generally decreases yield loss, indirectly improve yield. And, and this is one of the, the comments some of my colleagues tell me is that GMOs or genetic engineering will affect biodiversity. In fact, they saw higher insect biodiversity on farms. Now here, we're comparing the use of this technology versus the use of pesticide, because that's the only alternative that the, the farmers have uh, in, 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 in uh, developed countries. So the biodiversity was better. In the case of the use of herbicide resistance, the improvement in yield was not as high, and they did not find that plant diversity was affected. Now on the other hand, and this is important, this shows that this, 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 this study was done in a, in a neutral and non-biased way, is that they did find that there could be issues with genetic engineering plan if they are not used properly. And the problem is an environmental problem, is that you can have some weeds that can develop some resistance if the farmers are not using a crop rotation or, or, or not changing their herbicide, etc. So there can be negative effect if G G genetic engineer plants are not used properly. In conclusion on, on genetic engineering and biotech, uh, first thing is biotech is one component of the solution to food security. We're not, we're not trying to pretend that biotech is, is a silver bullet that could solve all the problems. There are a lot of other solutions, but biotech can play a role. Similarly, genetic engineering is only one of numerous biotech applications. There's been, as, as I hope I've shown, demonstrated benefit in terms of reducing pesticide, increasing yield, improving efficiency, product reach markets quickly, a more precise technology, and reduction of CO2 emission. And this is where the potential is, 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 is the use of this technology in improving nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, and improving photosynthesis efficiency. There's a lot of research, including some of the one I shared with you that, that are in this area, and this is where I believe this technology can play an important role in food security. To finish my talk, I, I will just talk about some perspectives and some technologies that could also contribute in the future to uh, food security, and, and I will say a couple of words on, on genome editing. Precision agriculture, we hear a lot more about this uh, recently, and the definition is basically uh, that, that this, te this uh, technology will aim to make decisions for farm management with the goal of optimizing returns on inputs while preserving resources. It can be different types of technology based either on satellite positioning system, rem remote sensing device, or, or diagnostic tools. The farmers will be able to use this technology to detect evidence, for example, of drought or pest uh, efficiency. Uh, I was recently at the Argan Congress, and we visited the, an area where they are planting trees, and they will start using some of this technology where they have sensors that are beside plants to monitor the amount of water so that they can deliver only the amount of water that's required. Another technology is, in particular in the area of genomic, is genomic selection that's based on high throughput genome sequencing using exploration sequencing, and this is to develop markers that will be used for breeding, and high throughput phenotyping. With the use of breeding, breeders have to go to the field and 
sometimes check plant by plant to monitor the effect of an introgression or, or, or gene transfer or, or, or cross. With the use of drones and, and, and computers, it will be possible to monitor uh, the, the progress and the improvement using this technology. Microbiome is another area that I believe provides a lot of opportunities. We knew very little, or we still know very little about the microbes in the soil because of their complexity, because we couldn't culture them. But now that we have the genome sequencing tools, we could basically identify and, 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 and use the information from this uh, sequencing, either as diagnostic tools or developing inoculum, in particular in the area of nutrient use efficiency. Genome editing is, is a relatively new area of genetic engineering. It was applied in, in a case of a, of a little girl named Leila that was, had a severe case of leukemia. And she lived in, or she was, she's living in England, and the doctors basically didn't have any, any solutions. And, other than maybe trying uh, a new technology at that time based on gene genetic editing. And basically what they did is they took uh, uh, blood cells from another person, they changed one gene and introduced them to the uh, little girl that was able to uh, accept those cells that basically reversed or at least stabilized her condition. And to my knowledge, uh, she, she's still healthy now. How does genetic editing work? There are different techniques. They use a method called talents. The method that's now becoming very popular and easy is called CRISPR, cluster, regularly interspaced palindrome repeats. An enzyme called Cas9 enzyme that's isolated from a bacteria is added with um, a guide RNA that will recognize the DNA that we want to change, and the enzyme basically will make deletion, insertions, or modifications to make the change. It is a precise, efficient method. It is different from transgenics because we're not transferring a gene from a different species, and it's comparable to metagenesis, which I indicated earlier that's considered non-GMO or similar, which is used in conventional breeding. And in my view, has a tremendous potential in crop improvement. Again, in a summary, in, in back cross, it takes seven to ten years. Genetic engineering, using transgenic, you take a gene or cisgenic from one line and put it in the other. And in the case of genetic editing, you within the same plant, you modify the expression of the gene and get the plant the desired right traits. Uh, I'd like to thank. Uh, several uh, funders in the wheat program, mostly farmer-based associations, Alberta Wheat, uh, Sask Wheat, and uh, Manitoba Wheat and Barley Growers are, are farmers, association of farmers in Canada. When a farmer sells a ton of wheat, they will take out 50 cents or a dollar, and that's put into research. And in the case of Sask Wheat, they can have five to ten million dollars depending on, on the yield. And it is a voluntary. So in other words, they, they take automatically the money and they ask the farmer, do you want your money back? And less than five percent ask for them their money back because they understand that this is going to benefit them. So uh, those have contributed to some of our project and, and some of our colleagues also that were partnered in this program. I will finish with this slide to indicate my research interest now at the University of Mahmoudsi's Polytechnique with several of our colleagues who are working on developing a research area in the microbiome, uh, tissue culture, genetic characterization of trees, uh, genetic resistance of cactus to cochineal and abiotic stress in the I would like to thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. To keep you asking questions. Presentation. Which uh, give us uh, a clear idea on uh, biotechnology use in uh, food uh, and also in therapy and medical uh, applications.
I am certain that the public is interested about uh, your subject and will uh, uh, contribute with the questions. So, si vous voulez participer avec les questions. Merci, professeur, pour votre excellente euh, présentation. J'ai deux questions. Je vais les poser en français. Pour vous. Alors, la première question, c'est que concernant ce débat, ce n'est pas maintenant. Alors, moi, je suis médecin, et on ne connaît pas exactement l'interaction du CGM, des organismes génétiques modifiés, avec la forme de la C'est ça qui pose le problème. Micro Oui, oui, c'est-à-dire que c'est bon d'accroître le rendement, de, de, de faire ce génie génétique sur les plantes, etc., d'assurer la sécurité alimentaire pour la, les populations à venir, etc. C'est vrai, à un moment donné, les, la population de, de la Terre n'aura peut-être pas suffisamment d'aliments, etc. Tout ça, c'est du génie génétique sur les plantes, c'est très bien, le ratio génétique, mais à quel prix Parce que c'est vrai, jusqu'à maintenant, on ne connaît pas, il n'y a pas d'évidence, il n'y a pas de preuve d'interaction entre les bactéries, l'intestin, et de, de, de l'estomac avec ces GMO. Peut-être que ça va venir, c'est les limitations se font tous les jours. La réparation de l'ADN humain, animal et végétal, etc., c'est des réparations qui se font tout le temps. C'est le développement de cancer d'un certain nombre de maladies, etc. C'est vrai, c'est comme les économistes, comme vous voyez, moi je, de toute façon, je discute, je ne reproche rien ni à un scientifique. C'est comme les économistes, vous allez, vous allez voir, un de l'axe des, des ordonnées, les Y, là, le, le, le rendement, et les abscisses X, donc cette année, en 1990, on n'a pas tant de tonnes de blé, en 2000, donc c'est une droite linéaire, sans tenir compte des paramètres, etc. Qu'est-ce que vous dire Donc c'est par la CP, l'analyse de la composante principale, qui permet de remettre les choses dans, dans l'ordre, etc. Donc la première question, c'est ça. La deuxième question concerne l'enzyme dont vous avez parlé, la, la CRISPR-Cas9. C'est vrai, c'est une révolution, ce qu'on appelle le discours de l'ADN. Euh, en médecine, nous, c'est les chercheurs qui tous, qui, eux, qui, qui arrivent à, 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 à inciser, si vous voulez, le gène défectueux éventuellement pour traiter le cancer. Ce qu'on appelle la médecine personnalisée, le bon traitement pour le bon malade, etc. Est-ce qu'au lieu de faire, par exemple, comme vous avez mentionné dans votre présentation, de faire ces bridings, ces, ces, le, le, le croisement entre la plante A et B, etc., parce que ça prend peut-être plus de temps, c'est coûteux, etc. Je sais, moi, je suis vétérinaire, j'en sais quelque chose. Est-ce que, au lieu de faire ça, se servir de cet outil, éventuellement, pour insérer des gènes de résistance contre les pesticides, contre les maladies, etc. Au lieu de faire ça, ça peut-être permet de gagner plus de temps. Et comme c'est une nouveauté, c est, c est, c est, ça permet de, de gagner beaucoup de choses en termes de temps, d'argent, etc. Et je vous remercie. On one, and I'll start with the second question. Yes, the objective is to use genetic editing in crops. It has been already start. People are, are using them. There's evidence that it can be used in, in plants and improving uh, resistance to disease, and it will be a lot quicker. The more we know about the genome, the more we sequence the plants, the more we understand the, 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 the function of these genes, the better we can manipulate them to a desired. Factor. I'm not saying this technology is ready right now, it's not, it's still in progress, but it has tremendous potential. On, on the safety of, of genetic engineering plants, I'm not going to give you the proof that these are not so. I, I, I think the one thing to keep in mind is sometimes we differently we confuse a product from a process. Genetic engineering is a process. The genes that are present in genetically engineered crops, and I'll give a few cases. For example, in Canal. I lived in Saskatoon, are surrounded by GMO. 95% of the oil produced, or the, the canola produced, was made from genetically engineered plants. I had no hesitance to feed my, myself and my kids with oils that are made from genetically engineered canola. For one reason, it's, it's oil. It's not DNA. When you extract the oil, you remove oil. Nevertheless, even eating DNA, I don't see the issues until it's proven to me that it has an effect and it has not been. We have hundreds and thousands of bacteria, as you, as you mentioned, in our guts. The gene that we are putting in, in, in those plants, maybe it's already there in those bacteria. Once we eat the plant, the gene is not in a state of function. As soon as it gets in our guts, it's it's cut, it's not expressed. In the case, for example, of, of, uh, of the BT that I hear, in that case, why the genes affect the caterpillar 
but not humans? The answer is very biochemical, it's very simple. The toxin is very liable to acids. So as soon as we eat, the protein is chewed, it's, it's fragmented. So it has no effect in humans. On the other hand, in the caterpillars and the insects don't have it. So again, I'm not saying that every genetically engineered product is safe or would be safe. What I'm saying is there is no proof up to now that it can have it. To tell me that you have to prove a negative, and nobody's going to be able to do that. All I can say is that in the last 30 years, genetically engineered plants have been used in North America, and in, in Asia, in South America. There has not been one single case demonstrated of a health effect on, on using this genetic engine. Because DNA is just DNA, it's expressed, uh, and, and you have to look at the product. And if the product, and then there's been a lot of testing that were done to demonstrate that they're equivalent. Basically. Personally, I've been very much concerned about diet, about salt, about sugar, about heavy metals, much, much sooner than worrying about genetically modified plants. I, I, I honestly, until it's shown to me that there is a, there's a negative effect, I stay on my position. But I'm prepared to change my mind. I'm prepared if somebody shows some data. <laughs>